This is Cybersecurity Best and Worst Website Practices and Trends. And today we have with us Joe Palukas and Stephen Marches. Marcheso. Say it again. Marcheso. Marcheso. Great last name. Marcheso. So introducing, we have Joe. He is the Manager of Information Security and IT Security Officer at Oakwood Healthcare in Dearborn, Michigan. And he has been at Oakwood for about five years. Stephen is a senior architect, right? Okay, with Caretech Solutions, where he's been for about 10 years. In his role, he audits and architects web systems and application security controls across the organization. Join me in welcoming them. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. As we've already been introduced, I'm Stephen Marcheseau, Security Architect, Caretech Solutions. Caretech Solutions provides IT services for the healthcare industry. I'm Joe Palukas, work for uh, Oakwood Healthcare. You all know what a hospital does, right? Uh, that's our deal. <laughs> right. So uh, the learning objectives we want to talk about today are to identify the common types of security threats, um, discuss the effective safeguards to help prevent those threats or mitigate them if they're identified, and related to that, recognize the common types of threats and uh, vulnerabilities you may experience. So I'm sure many of you have read the news lately. Past few months, a lot of uh, cybersecurity news. A um, lot more in the retail industry than the healthcare, but recently in August, uh, a very large breach to one uh, large system in which 4.5 uh, million records were taken from that institution. Um, and then just after that, the FBI released a liaison report uh, to all of the security professionals in the healthcare industry, uh, informing them that um, healthcare industry is now being heavily targeted for uh, cyber attacks. Um, uh, more recently in September, uh, many of you know the healthcare.gov website. Um, that one particular website was hacked. It was only the staging website, so it was uh, fake patient data used for testing, but it shows that no one is uh, you know, safe for any of the cybersecurity uh, news. Um, also more recently, not listed here, some um, recent articles say that um, Credit card data is one of the common things that's being stolen in the media lately, but they're saying anywhere from five to 50 times um, more valuable is patient information. So uh, because of that uh, higher price on the, on the black market of the web, um, healthcare is being heavily attacked. So we're gonna go into some more detail on some of the common threats that I mentioned on, a, on an earlier slide. Um, I'm not gonna read them off here, but uh, is anyone familiar with any of these threats? Anybody been a victim of any of these threats? Want to admit it? <laughs> I'll cover uh, in high detail, uh, or high level detail here, um, just a few of these here. We'll go into more detail of a few of them in the presentation later. But a SQL injection, it's a very common attack nowadays in which um, an attacker can either insert data into your website or actually retrieve data from your website. And it's always typically done unauthenticated. So, they're not bypassing any, you know, they're bypassing security altogether to do that. Um, DDoS and botnet we'll cover later, but that actually makes your website unavailable to your public users. Um, so it doesn't take anything usually, it doesn't steal anything, but it just makes your, your whole web presence unavailable to the public. Um, moving on to phishing and spear phishing, those are email attacks. I'm sure you're all uh, aware of what spam is and you get email spam. Uh, phishing is um, a type of spam in which they're targeting people within your organization. Uh, at that point, you might click on a link that takes you to a malicious site and it's grabbing information um, you know, from you. Spear phishing is just more targeted. Typically, it might be at the, you know, you might target the COO or CEO of an organization uh, and try to get that privileged information from that user. Uh, social engineering. Social engineering is uh, the practice of manipulating a person into doing something, whether they know they're being manipulated or not. Uh, the more common one and dealing with web would be the social media engineering, we call it. And that's uh, becoming friends on Facebook, becoming friends or, or contacts on LinkedIn for the sole purpose of learning more about that individual or more about that organization and then um, you know, acting as if you're that person on the web. And then lastly, malware, ransomware. <clears throat> I'm sure you're aware of what malware is. It's a type of virus. It's typically a program or something that gets downloaded onto your workstation. Um, ransomware is the more scary one and more common one now in which 
that virus or that piece of software actually um, prohibits you from accessing it until you pay money. So it might encrypt data that's valuable to you or your organization, and then you have to pay anywhere from like 500 to thousands of dollars to get it back. Uh, so let's start with an introduction into uh, security. Um, security, uh, a, a very important topic or, or uh, uh, thought is that security should never be an afterthought. You should always be concerned with security throughout your whole cycle of development of your website. So you want to make sure that you integrate it into every process all the way from the planning phase, the um, you know, implementation phase, the testing phase, and then even after go live with the continuous monitoring. Um, you also want to audit the site during the process. Um, you want to audit your hosting environment, which we'll go into later. And you also want to audit or look at your code for security. Uh, your code is usually developed by maybe your uh, developers on staff, or you might have a third-party vendor, but you want to make sure they have um, are using best practice for security. Oh, but before we go to the next slide real quick, I do want to define two basic um, types of uh, acronyms that we'll be using later in the presentation. PHI, um, if you don't know, it's protected health information and that's your patient records. And then PII, which is not health information usually, but it's protected identifiable information. So it's something like maybe um, just your first name, last name, a credit card, something that uh, needs to be secured, but it's not necessarily patient information. So related to what Steve talked about, we want to talk about some core security principles that complement uh, or what you need to be in, in ter uh, sorry, incorporating into your uh, design processes. Also, if you want to keep you know, security folks such as Steve and myself off your back, toss out any of those acronyms, you know, I want to include CIA in my, in my design, or I've included CIA, they'll be like, good, good for you. <laughs> so we've, I'll be, we'll be going to each of these uh, sections in a, in a lot, little more detail. Um, security does seem to be more concerned with confidentiality, and we, we will touch, uh, touch quite a bit on that, which is preventing unauthorized disclosure of information. Um, integrity as well, and I know probably to the most of the folks here, availability is, is critical. And I th think the key theme we want to mention is you know, security, as Steve mentioned, should be considered throughout the process and not an afterthought. And really what we want to, part one of the things we want to hammer home here is that considering security is, uh, is going to help ensure you do have your system available. You, the last thing you want is to be the victim of an attack or some type of hack because you didn't consider security. And, therefore your site's no longer available. Another security principle is uh, AAA. Uh, AAA stands for authentication, authorization, and auditing. Uh, authentication is who you are. So it's typically if you're on a website and there's a login box, let's say for the administration of your site or a patient portal, you provide yourself with a unique identifier like a username and then a password. That's your authentication process. So you're proving who you are. Then once you've done who you are, you now move to the authorization. What, what are you allowed to do? So now that you have access, are you allowed to do, you know, edit a page? Are you allowed to insert this information? Um, with this portion, you want to make sure you're providing your users, your public, whatever it may be, with the minimum amount of access necessary. Um, you don't want to use the concept of, I'll just give them admin because it's easiest and they'll never have to come back to me. Um, make sure you give them only what they really need. And then auditing. It's um, what did you do? So it, it's auditing everything that happens within the system. If you're logging in, who logged in? When did they log in? If they accessed a patient record, you know, what patient re did they access? Why, um, how long did they have that record open? Things of that nature. Um, but you don't want to do too much auditing because then you go uh, by the theory of death by logs where you're just consuming so much auditing logs that you just end up brushing on, under the rug and ignoring them all completely. So getting back to the, to the, CIA, the CIA triad, we're going to talk in a little more detail on each of those uh, three components. So related to confidentiality, really the, the, the key takeaway for confidentiality overall is, you know, it's, it should be a term everyone in healthcare does know. It comes down to that, the point of minimum necessary access. You're only allowing, you know, the intended viewers to view that data. And there's uh, def Definite many, definitely many different ways that you can uh, facilitate that, that occurring. One of the first topics within the confidentiality area is website encryption. It's typically one of the easiest ones to implement. Um, the, the typical way of implementing it is using an SSL. An SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, 
What that does, it's, it's typically when you're on uh, a website and you see the little lock in the corner, or you may see uh, in the address bar it says HTTPS, it begins with, you're using SSL at that point. Um, what that does is it encrypts all your data from your browser, so that's your Internet Explorer, Firefox, all of that, and it encrypts it as it transmits over to your web server. So that means if an attacker is trying to gain access to that information while it's in transit, it's protecting that. There's no way for them to easily decrypt that um, and look at that information. So it, an easy form is that SSL. Um, what you want to use SSL for is any user input. So you don't need to SSL your whole site. Um, you can if you want. Um, but what we do recommend is anytime someone's typing in anything, so whether I'm sure you all have a contact us form on your site, um, whether you realize it or not, people, visitors could put patient information in there. Um, so it, it's, it's a good idea typically to use SSL anytime user information is submitted. Also login screens, so your administration of your website, let's say, um, maybe a patient portal screen that they're logging into. Also payments. If you accept payments, like credit card payment, uh, you have a class registration system, something of that nature, you always need to use SSL. You don't want to be transmitting that secure data. Um, or insecurely, that, uh, that data. You'll see a big theme within, uh, within confidentiality is, the, is encrypting data or ensuring data is encrypted. Um, many sites have email baked into, the, into their design and you know, sending emails uh, to others you know, within the organization or outside of the organization. And as Steven mentioned, you never want to send PHI or PAI, PII out to unencrypted. What you, one of the key questions you want to ask if you are sending, or sending email from your site is do you have a, any type of secure email gateway that's doing some work to help encrypt messages that are going out? Um, you'll get tired of my story, here, but I'll, I'll give you some, some background, some lessons learned from my time at Oakwood. We, uh, we have a secure email system. I can, don't want to sell it, you know, tell you what, you, what we have, but I can tell you afterwards. But we, um, we were taking a look at it and said, well, we need to, we need to start utilizing this. You know, we're, we're sending, we're seeing like PHI, PII getting sent out all the time. So, you know, we started doing some analysis and said, well, we need to, there's this encryption method called TLS, um, transport layer security. And we have a, a way to turn it on where any email we send will be secure through TLS. We're like, great, let's do that. So one of the lessons learned we, learned was, well, you can turn it on, but that doesn't mean everybody else is set up to receive it. So after a few, you know, undelivered delivered emails, a call from the CIO, we uh, went back to, uh, you know, went back to the drawing board and uh, determined what we need to do. So w w how we addressed that was we do configure, we do send out any emails by default to go s to send out secure. If somebody does not have the ability to receive a secure, secure via TLS message, we fall back to sending it out unencrypted. And then at that point, we have rules defined in our secure email gateway that look for key identifiers, such as like a medical record number, um, uh, can't think of another one, um, like a financial number, any, anything that, that was considered by the business important. And at that point, the rules will interrogate the message and then send, send, out, send out the email to somebody saying, you have a new electronic submission waiting for you, meaning they have to log in to accept that email. So it's another way and method of encrypting that message from going out. Um, another type of encryption, as Joe said, that uh, we're on the encryption topic is database encryption. Uh, database is typically where your data is located from your website. So for instance, um, if you have a content management system that you're using, typically it'll use some database to store all your content information in. Um, one of the things you want to do is make sure that any sensitive information that is being stored in that database is encrypted. So that would include the PHI, the PII, any other sensitive data like credit cards. If you happen to store credit cards, we'll talk about that later in the presentation. Um, make sure they're encrypted. Um, another uh, form is hashing. Hashing is one-way encryption. So what that means is that you can't undo it. Uh, that's the best way for passwords. So what you'll do is, if you're a new user, you'll put in your new account, it'll hash your password and store that. Um, then every time you log in, your website maybe will create the, the hash using its proprietary algorithm, and then it'll compare the two hashes. So it never really knows your password anymore at that point. Um, that's the recommended way of uh, doing passwords. And then for maximum protection, you can actually encrypt the whole database, whether it's all the data in it, or the whole database container on the outside, if it supports that. 
you also want to make sure that I'm sure you're doing backups, let's say daily. Those backups probably are going to some type of tape, like a physical tape, in your organization. Then they might go off site for DR, uh, disaster recovery, things of that nature. You want to make sure those are encrypted. So as data moves outside your organization or backups, encrypt as much as you can for that. So just keeping with the um Keeping in the confidentiality uh, area, and as Steve had talked about with passwords, you, you can never have too many passwords, right? So it's uh, something we all have a ton of. Um, you see a little uh, business card on the side here at, uh, at Oakwood. When I uh, first came to Oakwood in 2010, one of the first things I learned was that we didn't require anybody to change their passwords or to require any password complexity. So we had, you know, we had people with, uh, you know, even like within IT that had passwords that were like 13 years old that they'd never ever changed and um, so we, I kind of made it a point or a mission of mine to say well I have to if I, I do one thing here at Oakwood I have to get Oakwood to be able to change passwords to say I work in security to say I work somewhere that doesn't require you to change passwords I, I couldn't do it and how I helped kind of move that along was we had this little thing called meaningful use that was coming up and this the threat of these audits that were going to be coming down, and I, and myself and compliance, we pretty clearly articulated to the organization that, you know, there's no way we're passing a meaningful use audit. There's no way any of us are going to sign off saying we're, uh, our organization is secure if we don't, we can't say we at least, you know, require this, this basic security requirement. Um, I'm not sure if anyone, if everyone's familiar with these, um, these, um, the terminology related to this, specifically a strong password. It almost, I see a lot more of that. Any website I go to now, where you, when you're starting to put in a password, and it'll start telling you, is it, is it weak? Is it you know, kind of getting there? Is it strong? And so, so a strong password generally incorporates um, some of the items you see on the little business card there, upper and lower case letters, symbols, and numbers. Um, as mentioned up here, you want you want something a little bit more complex, but of course you don't. You want something that you you aren't going to forget. So it is recommended you use pass phrases. So some phrase you know and pick out the first letter of each phrase to to create your password. And then lastly, that uh, passwords should be changed often. We we our, our struggle at Oakwood was uh, the physicians not wanting to change their passwords. But again, we just raised the risk, raised the issue, and. They, they came around and you know, we, we did have to follow kind of a slow method, method, met, methodical approach to get it to happen, but we finally did. Uh, another topic in confidentiality is hosting disclosure. Uh, what this is describing is the uh, hosting method in which you're, you know, where your website is actually hosted on a web server of some sort. Um, so most of the internet runs on one of two platforms. It's using Win Microsoft Windows with IIS or it might be using a Linux operating system with Apache. Um, both of those technologies have this default screen, we call it. So it's like a splash screen, and it says, hi, I'm hosting Apache, or I'm hosting IIS. Um, you you want to try to not give an attacker um, at any information, but uh, very little information about your hosting. It's, it's impossible to, you know, hide it completely, but the easiest way is, you know, get rid of those splash screens. So if the site's not ready yet, you're not launched yet, but you're working with your IT or your vendor, and they throw up that screen, make sure they remove it, put up your logo, put up something, leave it a white screen, just remove it. Um, you'll also want to make sure you don't uh, display detailed errors to your user. This is a very common mistake within most environments. Um, we have an audit that runs every single day at our organization that looks for these within our code. So what we're talking about here is, let's say I'm on visiting your website, and I type in some weird random string of characters, hit enter, and it causes an error on your website. It then says, you've caused an error, and you've caused it on line 253 of your code. Here's your database. It's hosted in Michigan. Uh, you know, all this information. And attackers love that. That's like Christmas to them. So you want to make sure you disable that. And it's very easy in most uh, coding languages. It's, there's usually a setting that says, you know, disable these custom errors. Um, what we've gone even a step further, and we created our own error screen. So we made it very generic. It's a white screen. It says application error. It says, we're sorry, you know, for the inconvenience that we caused. But We've notified our administrators and, uh, you know, check back later or click here to go back to the home page. So, you know, do something very generic like that so that you're not giving that information to an attacker. So with uh, sticking with confidentiality, with credit card handling, and we'll, we'll definitely go into more detail um, 
related to credit cards in general and, and the PCI, which we'll talk about and define. But uh, related to credit cards, you, if at all possible, if you don't want to store credit card numbers, but if you do, you do have to ensure that you are encrypting them. And uh, as Stephen mentioned, using something like SSL to, if you're transmitting that data. Um, something I'd learned, I didn't know, I probably should have, is uh, you're never supposed to store the, the CVV number. And I can never remember if it's on the front or the back of the card, but it's the, it's the number on the back of the card. Um, per PCI and legally, you're not, not, off, not authorized to store that information. Again, if you are uh, going to be storing any credit card data, re uh, define retention periods. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Fight Club. You know, there's, a, there's like the, what is the first rule of Fight Club? And it's the same thing, it's the same thing with credit cards. Like, what is the first rule of credit card handling? You do not store credit card numbers. What is the second rule? You do not store credit card numbers. So if at all possible, do not store credit card numbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to our second principle within the CIA triad is integrity. Um, what integrity uh, does is it guarantees that data is, not, is protected from accidental or deliberate changes or modifications to that data. Um, there's many different methods. We'll go into one just uh, next. But you can also do hashing techniques. That's a way to make sure emails, for instance, haven't changed. So typically, when uh, Joe was talking about TLS earlier and email encryption, you can actually hash it, send it to your uh, other end, and then they'll hash it too, and they'll compare, and they realize the email hasn't changed. Um, but what it does answer is that the data is guaranteed to be in the same form and content that the user submitted it. So what we're talking about here is to validate your user input. Um, it's, a, it's an easy way to preserve integrity on your website, and many people um, think they're doing this, but they're either not doing it efficiently or not doing it the correct way. So what we're talking about user input is what we were talking about a little earlier. It's, let's say, your contact us form, your uh, patient registration form, appointment request, anything that you're gathering information from from that user. What you'll want to do is validate that that information is correct. And what we mean by correct is if you're accepting an email address field, you should only be accepting email addresses. If someone types in some other data that's not an email address, you should be denying that. So there's two types of validations. There's the client side and the server side. The client side is typically when you're on your contact us, you fill in, you hit submit, you got those red things that say, you didn't do this right. Your, you know, your phone number's in the wrong format, email address in the wrong format. That's what's considered client side. It's the browser telling you, you know, can you correct this, and then resubmit. Uh, server side is once it's been sent, you've, you've successfully passed client side validation, it's being sent to the web server. The web server now looks at it and says, wait a minute, this phone number, I'm expecting a phone number on this field and it's, you sent me some SQL injection code. I should deny this. That's what server-side validation is. That is typically the portion in which most organizations don't do. They only do client-side. So you want to make sure, go back to your development, go back to your IT. Are we also you know, validating some of this data on the server-side as it hits our web server? Um, what that does is it prevents someone from typing in malicious code. So for instance, they type in an HTML and all this information might have a, a malicious link in it. They might do a, a SQL code, which would successfully pull off a SQL injection attack and maybe you know, deface your website in some way. Um, you just don't really, in most cases, want to support any markup languages. So languages are coding languages. Um, the easiest way to also stop automated bots from submitting your data, you might have an issue with your, let's say, contact us page. And every day you get 20 spam emails because some bot hit you and they you know, send you links to medicine or all these you know, stupid spam emails. Um, what we recommend and an easy fix for this is what's called CAPTCHA. And it prevents those computers or bots from actually submitting that data. I'm sure you've all been to a site where you're supposed to type in some crazy you know, string of name or number or something and you can barely read it. Um, in most cases, you don't have to make it too difficult. Google, I think, has a really difficult one. There's a few other sites that have hard ones. You, you want to just be somewhere in the middle road so that the bot can't submit it. So CAPTCHA is a good uh, feature to add on your user input forms. So moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about availability, which is the third leg in the, uh, the CIA triad. You know, as we mentioned, it's ensuring that you're, you want to ensure that your system is available and ready to use. Uh, one, one of the key, I guess, key components for this is, is to make proper use of the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone. So for example, you're going to want your, your web server, the, the point where all your external users are coming in, to be segregated from where all the, the data that the hackers and attackers want to get. So your web server should be in the DMZ. 
with proper um, you know, passwords or controls if, if, if necessary in order to get to that, the database that houses all the, all the data within the internal network. Again, you want, you want to do what is necessary to ensure your data is going to be available and online. Okay. So the, um, the next topic related to availability is to secure your domain. Uh, hopefully everyone knows what a domain is. It's, you know, at oakwood.org, at caretech.com. So it's the, you know, the end part of the after the ampersand. It is, I, I'll go into another, another story here. I can't, can't express how critical it is to, to secure your domain. This is really the lifeblood of your, of your website. Um, some of the key, um, some, and some of this just seems obvious, like you don't know which domains your organization owns and consolidate all your domains into one account. At Oakwood, I, when I got there, I learned we had, we had domains secured, like I, I was securing some of the domains and then somebody else was securing them. So we were, we were all paying money to re-register these domains and you know, finally we got them all into, into one account. And then of course you wanna, again we talked about passwords, you wanna ensure that nobody can get in there and manipulate that domain. Um, outside of your knowledge. Um, again, one of my uh, stupid stories here, keeping your, your who is up to date. So one, you know, one day I got, a, I got when I took over uh, in security at Oakwood, some uh, domains were expiring and I got the notification, hey, you need to re-register. And I went online, logged in, because I had the ID and password. Click, 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 done. I'm like, oh, I'm done. And uh, I, I got a, got a call from the uh, domain, the, the registrant saying, hey, you need to approve that you've registered this domain. You need to confirm you are who you say you are. And I said, well, I just did. I just went on and did this. And they're like, no, the, the who is person needs to do it. I'm like, who is, who is what? And they, and they said, well, yeah, we sent an email to who the person identified as the who is administrator. And I go, well, that's me. And they're like, no, it's not. So I'm, I'm freaking out because this, this website's about to expire. That everyone that everyone uses, and I, I can't figure this out. I'm calling like our calling our marketing administrator. I'm calling the <laughs> I'm calling my boss, calling everybody, saying, "Hey, do you know do you know who has this?" Finally, we figured out who who this notification went to, and had them go in and say, "Yes, you know we are re-registering the site. All, all is good." But then I immediately <laughs> went in there and said, "All the who is's are going to me and another um, another backup person." So it's. It was a, I guess, you know, in terms of availability, it was a scary lesson learned. We didn't want um, <laughs> to lose the ability to use that site. So. Yeah, Joe and I. Were... What's that? Yes, we are very lucky. <laughs> yeah, so we want to really stress how important this topic is because I've seen personally um, clients lose their domain because it expired, and the, like Joe was saying, the who is wasn't updated, so they didn't get the email. It expired. Luckily. They give you usually 30 to 90 days of a grace period, they call it, which you can then renew. But go back to your organization. If you're not the person who owns the domain, go to the person who does. Make sure that information's up to date. Um, but keep that up to date because we it, it can really impact the organization, especially if it's lost. Because chances are your email's on it too. So the whole email for the organization goes down. Your website goes down. You can see the impact here is, is quite severe. The next uh, topic in availability is DDoS and botnets. Like we talked at the beginning about uh, different cyber threats, uh, DDoS and botnets are, are one of them. I'll define what DDoS is. It's a distributed denial of service. So what that means is it's distributed usually geographically across either you know, cities, countries, whatever, across the world, and they attack your website. Um, a botnet is usually a collection of computers or servers in which the attacker leases or uses or is using of, you know, unsuspected users and using it to attack you or attack an organization. Um, all this does typically is, it, like I said, it doesn't usually destroy data or manipulate, it just brings your website down. So if you've seen and read the news, you'll see, you know, okay, so-and-so, this organization was affected by a DDoS and was unavailable for a, you know, whatever period of time. So it just brings your whole web presence down. Um, the common uh, vectors of this attack are HTTP, which is your standard web traffic, your HTTPS, which is your SSL traffic, and then DNS. And DNS, we won't go into too much detail, but that's how your domain knows what IP address to go to. It, it creates that relationship there. Um, we've actually protected not only Oakwood, but many of our clients from DDoS attacks before. Um, the quick fix for us was to block that traffic. 
uh, per, or for you know a temporary period of time until that attack went away. Uh, we noticed for Oakwood, it came out of the country. Uh, we're not going to name any of the countries, but it came from, uh, I believe, just a few handful of countries. It was China. And, <laughs> 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 and what we ended up doing is we utilized what's called a GOIP database. So we purchased a, um, there's a very large, the largest provider that provides GOIP databases. We purchased that. We installed it on a um, device that is capable of um, looking up data and saying uh, IP versus country. And what we were able to do is uh, create a rule that said we want to start dropping this traffic and not hitting our web servers with that traffic. So it was what we would call the quick fix. It's not something permanent. Um, you don't really want to usually block certain countries because you might have business uh, in those countries. Um, but it is a quick fix to get the site back up. And then as you see that attack dwindle, you can then release that rule. The uh, long-term attack or uh, method to prevent this, which we've learned, would be your rate limiting. Rate limiting is basically saying from a single IP address, let's say, I, uh, normal traffic is under 1,000 hits per second or 100 hits per second, whatever it may be, it's a threshold. If it exceeds that, drop the traffic. So it's going to say, hey, you know, all of a sudden we got this, this one IP in this other country start really hitting us. That device, there's devices in which we can talk to after the, the uh, presentation here that can actually drop that data for you. Um, so that's more of the permanent fix for it. And I think that's a good, it's a good topic to ask, you know, your security teams about at your organizations, you know, what are they doing to prevent, you know, attacks from all these countries? And, you know, it wouldn't be security if we didn't talk about something scary, but I'm, I'm sure all of you, you know, have read all these different countries attacking and it's, and one of the key, uh, key, other key items you see in the news too is that healthcare is looked upon as a, as a weak or, a, or an easy target. So it's, uh, it's definitely something to be, um, vigilant about. So another uh, topic we want to, want to address is uh, preventative security. And, and this goes into what Steve had mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. We want, we feel security should be considered throughout the, the life cycle of really anything you do, but you know, in specific here to, to website design. And so we want to do, do want to ensure that you are including the principles discussed in the CIA triad and apply that to the, um, to the primary parts of a, of a website. Just to provide a little bit of detail, with the uh, parts of the website for a content management system, as you, as you know, you could you know, purchase third party, build your own, or um, use some type of open source provider. There's you know, benefits and risks with each, with each approach. Um, what you do want to consider those, you know, what, you know, what level of security does your CMS provide? So for example, if you're building your own authentic authentication mechanism, you should, you know, I would recommend have somebody from your security team um, do some testing, validate that it is working as expected. Um, does your CMS provide a workflow or prop, proper approvals? Um, are there, you know, as we talked about, is there auditing logs? And are, are you auditing on the key, uh, key components? And are, you, and are you auditing too much? And if, whatever you are auditing, you do need to ensure that you're reviewing and following up on. And then uh, kind of la the last couple points here too is, uh, Definitely, the last sub bullet is is definitely a good best practice. Is just that you're publishing to a, a staging environment, not just right to production. That this is assuming you're doing some testing beforehand, and, and of course you want to ensure your uh, content management system is uh, patched as well, up, up to up to date in terms of protecting against the latest vulnerabilities. Our next topic within uh, pre preventative security is content planning. You should know the content on your website. Uh, you want to make sure that it's uh, clean of any security risks. And what we would consider a security risk is maybe private data appearing on your public website. So make sure you know what's being posted. If you're the person posting it, you obviously probably do know. But there may be times where private data that is insecure, you know, not behind a login screen or a patient portal or something of that nature, is on your website. Um, you also want to be wary of the ease, uh, easy access for your employees. Um, just because you want to make it easy for them doesn't mean that some of that data is private. Uh, if, if it is private data, there should be authentication. Like we talked about AAA, uh, you should be authenticating before they can even see any of that data. So don't make it too easy. If there are policies and practices that shouldn't be on your public site, bring them on your intranet or bring them behind a secure login of some sort. Another thing to know is that every single piece of information on your public uh, website is being indexed by search engines, unless you explicitly say not to. So typically the way you would do that is a, what's called the robot.txt file. It's a file that sits at the root of your, of your website, and it says, 
I don't want, uh, you know, Google, I don't want you to look at this directory or this page or this piece of content. Um, so that is the easiest way to tell, uh, you know, some of these good search engines. Now there's what I would consider evil search engines that are just going to ignore the robot and they're just going to spider the heck out of your site. So keep that in mind that the only the good ones uh, use that robot.txt, uh, the bad ones will ignore it. The other thing is the robot.txt is the attacker's uh, first thing they'll go for typically because they want to know what your dirty laundry is or what you're hiding. So don't think of it as, this is my private data, I'm just going to throw it in the you know, robot.txt file. Uh, attackers go there first. They want to know, well, why, are, why do they not want you to index this? So it's not a way to secure your website. It's just to say, I don't want Google to look at this you know, of any sort. Um, sticking with content, another thing is uh, iframes. Uh, if you're not familiar with what's an iframe, uh, it, it stands for inline frame, and what it is is, for instance, you have your web page, and maybe you're pulling third-party content in from another web page, but you want it to seamlessly look like your page. So you, you load what's called an iframe, and it's, in, it's just basically almost like an invisible frame, and you don't know that it's being pulled from another site. Um, you've got to be very careful there, and you also want to make sure it's secure. Let's say you're gathering info. Maybe it's a, some type of user input from some other site. Uh, you want to make sure you're using HTTPS on your site, and then you want to make sure when you load that iframe, it's using HTTPS. So uh, be very cautious of iframes because they can be abused, and you may not know what uh, is being loaded. One day you're pulling in data from a site, and that provider suddenly changes their data, and now it changes your site. So keep, keep uh, you know, limited use on iframes. Yeah, Oakwood, Oakwood was using a third-party site for training and through some of our monitoring and detection tools we noticed that they were sending all of our traffic off to Spain for whatever reason. It turned out to be relatively innocuous but it was put a scare into us and something we had to uh, quickly address. Then lastly, uh, you know, web service feeds. I'm sure some of you may have like a health content library or some type of that other data. You pay a service, you're pulling in a web service feed. Make sure that feed supports HTTPS or, or SSL so that you're pulling it through securely. Even if it's not, uh, you know, PHI or PII, you can always use SSL. It's, there's typically no harm in using that. I'm not going to talk a lot about these content modules. I think the main thing is hopefully from what we've talked about thus far, you can kind of see how some of these security principles would need to apply to to each of these content modules. You know, obviously with, with bill pay, we're talking about potentially, you know, credit card information, um, PII, obviously with a shopping cart or donations, again, more um, potential for credit card information or um, personal information about um, be it a patient or just a, a customer of the, of the organization that may need to be encrypted. And then the last topic within preventative security is hosting. Uh, you want to, you wanna, whether you host internally at your organization or you have a trusted third-party provider, you want to know, you know, are they audited yearly? There's many types of audits out there. One of the more popular ones is the SSAE 16 audit uh, for an organization. Uh, CareTech Solutions goes through that yearly. We're uh, just finishing up ours for this year. You can usually ask them for a copy of it. We usually provide our customers a copy um, when, you know, when asked. And uh, it, it just, you know, forces them to have certain policies, procedures, you know, best practice in place, and you know it's a trusted third-party hosting provider. Uh, you also want to look at the different packages they offer, because there's pros and cons of them. Usually they'll have a dedicated one where you get your own dedicated server and your own little DMZ, and then they might have like a shared environment in which your data is, you know, not mixed. It is still separated, but it's sharing resources, maybe like the operating system or it's sharing server space. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Ask them those, you know, and how do they secure each of them. Um, you also want to ask your hosting vendor, how do they handle security incidents? Uh, typically, they'll have a policy and practice uh, out there to say, well, if the website, you know, let's just say, how do we handle an incident if the website goes down or if the server's off, they'll turn it back on. But we're talking about security incidents here. What if an attacker attacks your site? Are they going to help you? Are they responsible for helping you in that attack? Or are you responsible? So make sure there's clear rules defined there on who's handling it, what kind of open communication there is between the two of you. Do you share your knowledge, what you're finding? Um, you want to make sure you have that. And then uh, you also want to know, does your technical team have uh, incident handling procedures documented? Because I'm sure every hospital you have your own dedicated IT um, or maybe it's an outsourced IT provider, but do they have documentation on how they're going to handle security incidents? 
So the next piece we want to talk about is performing a website risk analysis. And this could be considered preventive in a way, but effectively what this is, as it mentions here, is periodically assessing your, uh, your site for common threats and vulnerabilities. Um, there are a lot of good tools out there that, that can be used to do a, you know, a scan of your site and to identify if you've uh, got services or that, that shouldn't be running or services that are insecure or if you're uh, the server supporting your site, I haven't been patched. Um, and that kind of teeters over into being considered what's a vulnerability assessment, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in the next slide. But uh, when you do perform an, an analysis, um, it's something you should engage your security team with. And you're going to hear excuses, ah, we're understaffed, we don't have time, and blah, blah, blah. But it's definitely something you do want to, want to consider. Um, not only is it a best practice, but it's required for, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail as well, PCI DSS accreditation, and as well as for HIPAA and high tech overall. Um, as I mentioned, with the vulnerability assessment, the best practice is they should be conducted quarterly at a minimum. Um, again, for PCI, quarterly is a requirement. Um, I, I talked about this on the previous slide. There are, there are vulnerability scanners you can use. There's a lot of free tools out there that can be used just to do your own checkup on your site. I, I would encourage, you know, work with your uh, security department or your compliance department if you have anything to do with uh, credit cards. Whether you know it or not, you are, <laughs> You are subject to PCI standards. I think that's a, something people don't realize or realize the, uh, the depth of what's involved with that. Um, but ideally what you want to do is if, if you are, you want to identify these, prob these problems up front before they become a problem later down the line and then ensure those problems are addressed. And, and one of the key component, uh, key uh, concepts I want to talk about is that, is that last item. A lot of these uh, scanning tools you use will say, oh, you've passed, you've got a passing score. Well, it doesn't mean you're completely safe, or it doesn't mean you're out of the woods. Security threats are continuously evolving. You have to constantly stay diligent and on top of it. So it's just something you need to continuously be continuously monitoring. Uh, taking a step further beyond vulnerability testing is penetration testing. Um, penetration testing is an active attack on a website or a computer, and with the intention of actually trying to find a weakness or actually ex make an exploit on the website. Uh, so it's different than vulnerability. Vulnerability is just kind of a soft scanner or uh, you know, a, a, an individual who's paid to do the vulnerability testing. They'll just have findings. They won't actually attack your site. Penetration testing is, is much more um, in detail like that. Most of the time, you'll get a third-party penetration tester. You usually won't have in-house someone who's certified or, or knowledgeable enough to conduct one. Um, they usually come on site, uh, sometimes remotely, but um, they'll come on for what's called an engagement period. It's usually like two weeks, let's say, or maybe four weeks. You pay them a certain amount, and they only have that amount of time to try to find weaknesses on your site. There's usually a definition of scope to say what, you know, okay, we only want you to hit this site. You can only do this. We don't want you to exploit, you know, basically a do's and don't list so that you both are aware, you know, this is what we're doing, and there could be repercussions on doing that. Uh, there's typically three types of tests. We have the black, the gray, and the white. Black just means I don't give the penetration tester any information. They're just on their own. I say, here's the scope. Attack this website. Uh, I'll see you in two weeks and give me your, your, your executive report. Um, gray box is somewhere in between. You give them limited information, maybe a, a document that shows your hosting environment, maybe one credential, um, very uh, you know, limited information. And then a white box is giving them pretty much the keys to the kingdom. You'll give them a full scope. You'll give them a full layout of your hosting. You'll give them an admin credential, maybe a user credential. Um, you'll give them everything. Um, security professionals have different opinions, which are better. Uh, my opinion is the white box, just because the intention of a penetration test is to find weaknesses. Um, a penetration tester will always find weaknesses. You're, you're never, like Joe said, you're never safe. There's always a weakness. Um, so the intention is not to have a passing score. You shouldn't be, yay, you know, he didn't find anything. No. That just means maybe another penetration tester would find something. So the goal is, you know, find something so that I can correct it. So a white box, in my opinion, is better, uh, unlike a black box, where it might take him, you know, out of, out of two weeks, it might take him 12 days to knock on the front door of your website. He finally gets in, now he's got two days to find something else. So um, you want to use that time valuable, especially since it's, you know, probably expensive. For and, and Oakwood, we had a, we had a 
kind of a pseudo uh, penetration test. We had a we had a gentleman, a consultant on board that was helping us with a lot of uh, a firewall cleanup, and I know there was um, some other uh, sites and servers. We were a site we were getting ready to stand up, and some servers that were getting stood up. We hadn't put anything into production yet. But uh, he was monitoring the firewall and look at some some of our monitoring tools. So so this this gentleman would be would be classified as Steve mentioned as, as a, a white box tester. He you know he knew our environment had all the credentials and he was just looking at these servers that were thinking about standing up and you know, lo and behold he noticed like hey do you know you have these configured that are these configured to make like remote calls out to the internet so meaning it's free free calls going out meaning free calls for anybody to come into the to our sites and it's you know something that. You know, we raised raised eyebrows, and bef you know, before we, luckily, but before we rolled anything out, we we addressed it, and it's actually what much of what led us to having CareTech host our our website too. We wanted to, you know, take advantage of their continuous monitoring and their their ability to do some of that work for us. But I mean, it's definitely um, a worthwhile endeavor having someone you know, kind of kick the tires on your site. So I keep, I keep talking about PCI DSS. So this is, this is payment card industry data security standards. And I, I probably, I've said this probably too much already. If you are doing anything with credit card information, you are subject to PCI standards, whether you know it or not. And it's something you probably want to ask. If, you know, ask your security um, personnel, ask compliance or maybe your treasury department. If you should be looking at this, it, it, not necessarily you, but the the organization as a whole. Um, do you want to remember the uh, two rules of credit card storage? By the way, <laughs> yeah, never storm. One of the uh, one of the the key um, key lessons learned that I had with this was is you know we found out that we, I, when I rolled in, I knew knew all along that we were subject to. PCI and our, our struggle was well how do we how do we make it so we don't have to follow every nit and nat and every piece of this PCI standard and we thought well you know we encrypt everything we're we're doing we're doing what we need to do we we think we're good but we weren't a hundred percent sure so we had the brilliant idea of well let's reach out to our bank the bank is the one that gives us our passing score you know you know whether or not we're we're good. And we said, hey, you know, we, uh, we're not really sure how to answer this question in the PCI control framework, but this is what we think. You know, we're encrypting this. We're, we're, and we, we have, um, you know, our card readers are in a secure location. We don't, we don't have this network segmentation you're talking about. And, you know, but we're good, right? And, you know, it's just the silence on the phone. And, uh, and she, then she, the person on the other end responded. She said, you mean you're not doing any of that right now? Like, when, when have you, how long have you not been doing that? And I, I'm sitting next to our compliance, uh, our director of compliance. And I just watched like blood drain from his face because I won't go into numbers, but we pr process a significant dollar amount per month of credit card transactions. If our bank says you're not PCI, um, you're not you're not meeting the requirements of PCI, you will not be pr processing credit card payments anymore. And that I don't want to say it's the complete lifeblood of Oakwood, but it's I mean it's a big contributor to <laughs> to the bottom line. Um, and again, with this, one of the we to, to address this, we said I don't want to make any more guesses on whether we're meeting the standards or not. We reached out and um, located a what's called a QSA or a qualified security assessor. We had someone um, again certified to come in and say yes, this is good. No, this isn't good. This, yes, you need to fix that. No, you can leave that as is and come up with some options on how to um, beat PCI compliance. And one of the items that we did need to address was our one of our um, online um, um, sites that accepted donations for our, our foundation. We ended up um, moving to the to that company's hosted site because they were an, much like CareTech is a, an accredited PCI provider. Yeah, and like Joe said, you want to make sure the software, whatever's handling your credit cards, that also has to be accredited. So. For instance, CareTech Solutions offers our own CMS to our customers, and every year we have to go through that accreditation to make sure we're following best practice, we're sticking to those standards. Um, we've gone everywhere from the beginning 1.2 version, and we just did 2.0 recently, and we're now in the process of the 3.0 version. So you want to make sure with your, your CMS vendor or anything that's handling those credit cards that they are uh, PCI compliant. Yeah, and it's... I hate to say it, back to the scary, I mean, if you just, as Steve talked about the things that are in the news, I mean, how many Home Depot, all these other places that are getting their credit card numbers stolen, it's just, 
you know, they're not as valuable as the as the medical records are out, out in the uh, black market. But it's it seems like it's easy pickings at a lot of these uh, companies. So it's, it's I, I, we kind of hammered on this a little bit here. Well, like Joe said, <laughs> try not to store it. Really, I mean, most of the time you can pay a third party provider. There's third party providers like Authorize.net and other ones out there. You just pay them, you do a secure transaction to them, and you don't even have to store the, the, the credit card so that you've mitigated that risk for your organization. So you just store like the transaction ID to know that that person purchased something, but um, that's usually best practice. So on to our key points from the presentation, we just wanted you to, t to go back and be able to take a few things back and learn from this, is that security is not, never should be an afterthought. Like we said at the beginning, you should be thinking about this through your entire cycle of development for your website. And then even after, once you're live, with through continuous monitoring. Um, you want to use these basic security principles and also go back and ask these questions to your local IT. Uh, so your IT on staff there or your security department that you may have. Come, you know, take this presentation, go back, and, and ask them these questions. Have an open dialogue, um, and that's really important. And, and like we said, build security in all phases. Just some good uh, resources, or what we're calling a toolkit for anything related to security. This um, this OWASP site is is I'm not sure if anyone's has checked that out before, but it's a it's a great site for looking at the common risks that can impact um, a website. And not only does it talk about the risk, it talks about how prevalent or likely someone uh, a risk can be exploited and what you can do to address the risk and you know the business impact it's very uh, very thorough and then of course my favorite uh, PCI another great resource if you have any questions on PCI as well as just I think for general security you can't go wrong with um, NIST or National Institute Standards and Technology and then of course um, health information privacy for uh, for HIPAA and high tech and that's it any questions? Yes. Oh, for the vulnerability scanner, there's a few out there. Uh, CareTech Solutions. We use uh, something by Komodo. It's called Hacker Guardian. Um, there's also some other ones like Security Metrics. They provide a good one. Um, I would have to look up one or two more. I can't think of off the top of my head. But Security Metrics and uh, Hacker Guardian by Komodo. Those are two, uh, two very good ones. We, what we do from, at CareTech is we've purchased unlimited scanning through our vendor, and then we scan weekly. It's a, like Joe said, it's a, a quarterly mandate by PCI, but we choose to scan weekly because just in case changes occur during that week for production pushes, we can catch them as quick as possible. So we scan weekly, we get those reports, and they're actually part of our SAS 16 audit um, that we go through every year. Oakwood in general uses a tool by Qualys. Oh, yeah, Qualys Guard. That's yeah. a really good one. Qualys Guard is a good one, and Qualys has other good tools, such as their SSL Labs Checker. So I, we didn't include that in the toolkit, but uh, recently I'm sure you've heard vulnerabilities with SSL, like uh, Heartbleed. Um, you've heard about the Poodle attack, potentially, that happened recently. They're telling you to, to disable certain things of SSL. Qualys' um, test tests all of that information. So just search for Qualys uh, SSL Labs. Yeah. I think they'll provide like free, sometimes like free it's utilities. All, no, that one's use, free. Yeah. yeah, that one's free. And then there's a client browser version, which tests your browser, too. There's another question? Yeah. Okay, so there's two types of encryption. There's encryption in motion and encryption at rest. So, uh, we had talked a lot about in motion, so that's using SSL. That's like from the browser to the server. But at rest means when it's sitting there on the server. So for instance, like the database encryption, if you encrypt the whole database, that's database encryption at rest. It's sitting there. It's not moving. It hasn't left the server. Nothing's moving there. Same thing with your website files, maybe. You might have like Word documents you upload to the website. They sit on like a, 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 probably a web server or a file server. Uh, you can ask your IT or your hosting vendor, we would like to encrypt that at rest. So that means that it's not when it's in motion. Is that practice? Yeah. No, it's, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a, that's a good practice to abide by. Um, what that prohibits is if the attacker was able to get into, all the way into the web server, it's not while it's moving, but into the web server and take the data. If that data is encrypted, they can't do anything with it. The other type of encryption, we did mention it, is when you back up to tape, let's say you take backups off-site, if you're encrypting those backups, that's data at rest. So it's sitting you know, in a warehouse and you keep it for six months because that's your disaster recovery policy. Yeah, if you look at any of the, like, the HIPAA high-tech um, 
standards or regulations. They, when they're talking about data at rest, it tends to be more focused on the endpoint as well. But it, as Steve mentioned, you know, and I think especially in like a, a situation where your data is being hosted somewhere, you definitely want to. Penetration testing is up to the organization. Uh, it can be quite costly if you get a really good penetration tester. Uh, the ones I've spoken to and have worked with, the thing you need to know about security is you, like we talked about, you're always vulnerable. Uh, most of good penetration testers uh, have always found something. But they can be quite costly if you get like a two-week in, two engagement. So uh, it might be something you might do you know, once every few years, once a year, once every other year. You know, Like Joe yeah. mentioned, he, they hired a particular QSA, they came in, but it, it does get pretty costly. Yeah, and we're looking at doing another one too, and we're, it's, and then not to, not to get into the, to the weeds of it, you want to look at, so Steve talked about the different types, the gray, the white, and the black box, but then there's, do you want an internal versus an external? Right. It's a whole other, um, we've generally done like external assessments, so it's somebody just seeing, you know, more or less testing your perimeter, which is good, but, uh, and this is, this is where it gets dicey. We're, we're the, the heart or the, the real risk of security is inside. It's the, I think the, the security term is like hard on the outside, soft and chewy on the inside. But that's the hardest one to sell though, is that internal scan because then there's the, the risk of, you know, knocking over systems. You, so you have to be really, really cautious. So but I think, so I think it's a good, good to start with an external and maybe move into it. Yes. No, most of the encryption is not done from the, are you speaking like the operating system, like Windows or Linux or all that? It's usually not done there. It's usually done with like a third-party tool of some sort to encrypt. Uh, Windows does have something called BitLocker, which it can encrypt. But most of the time, you'll decide on like, let's say, a data at rest encryption mechanism. You'll have another piece of software that does that for you. Um, so I wouldn't say the operating system. There's no HIPAA-compliant operating system. It's, it's the practices you take to make sure that when you're hosting your website, you're doing it in a secure manner. So, you know, you're, you're making sure that, um, you know, the data is, uh, can't be shared with others. And maybe if you're sharing it with your private and public data, you don't want to mix that, things of that nature. But uh, I wouldn't say the operating system is HIPAA-compliant. No. Nah. I think it's it's going to be have you done an assessment on it and have you if you've identified any threats or vulnerabilities any types of weaknesses have you documented it have you created an action plan to address it and then most important have you done it have you actually followed up on that action plan the one thing I've, we forgot to mention in the presentation and a lot of people aren't doing is patching their hosting environment we forgot to mention that but we mentioned about patching CMS your content management system. I'm seeing a lot of uh, you know, other companies who haven't patched their OS in like a year. So in most cases, it's a pretty simple process, especially with Windows. You, you, know, you click a button, a few buttons, it looks for updates, it downloads and it restarts and you're done. So um, I highly recommend you keep up on that. We, uh, CareTech has a very stringent update policy that we do during our maintenance window. So it's off hours, it doesn't impact your website, things of that nature, so you should try to define that. And that's what Oakwood uses Qualys for. It's, we're using that as our um, vulnerability management solution. And as we're trying to move towards, uh, we're still taking some baby steps to get there, but we're trying to get to where you guys are at in terms of a continuous monitoring model where we're looking at these servers. Do they have um, ports that can be exploited? Or are they, a lot of these tools will look at um, common vulnerability databases and say, hey, yeah, you're, uh, your server's vulnerable to this known exploit. Here's what you should do. You know, here's the patch you should apply to ensure you address it. But then that's a, that gets into a whole other political and discussion in terms of uh, rolling it out. Well, it looks like we're out of time, but we, we'd be willing to stay here if you have more questions and you want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be on the flow rider. Thank you. 4.30. Yeah. Come on, see us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for us. <laughs>